So welcome everyone to HOMT 611 Event Management. In today's session, we will be looking at food and beverage planning, right? So today being our eighth session is going to be all about how at event professionals, we need to go about our food and beverage planning for the various events that we organize. Now, as usual, there are certain learning outcomes we hope to achieve by the end of the session. The first one is to be able to determine the food and beverage requirements for our events and also determine the food and beverage requirements of the attendees at these events, which are not the same thing. Then we will understand how to create an attendee profile and then also be able to discover current trends in the food and beverage industry or sector as it relates to the organization of events by event professionals such as yourselves. So these are the learning outcomes we hope to achieve by the end of the session. So let's begin. Why food and beverage at events? Now we are treating this topic because we want to specifically look at the role of the caterer and the beverage provider, who may be a mixologist or a bartender or any other term by which this particular person who provides beverages is known as in your part of the world. But in our part of the world, they're usually known as bartenders and currently mixologists have slowly crept into the mix. So when we talk about food and beverage at events, we are looking at those who are responsible for providing the food, who in this case are caterers, and those who are responsible for providing the beverages. Now in our context, we find that very often the one who provides the food, being the caterer, often also provides the beverages, isn't it? Yes. Good. But in recent times, the trend has moved towards the point where we have in some instances a separation of duty, where the one who provides the food, being the caterer, is different or separate from the one who provides the beverages or the drinks. So we need to take this into consideration when we are organizing events. Now, we also need to appreciate the fact that it is not only the choice of a suitable venue that determines the experience that the attendees at your events will have. In fact, the food and the beverage that is served to the attendees once they come to the event contributes a large part of determining the quality of their experience. So depending on how quality the food and beverage that you serve is, the more quality the experience that your participants will have. So in certain scenarios, you hear people attend events and they come back and the conversation centers around the food and drink that was served. And then you hear someone say something like, the drinks didn't flow at all. Have you heard that before? Yeah. Drinks didn't flow. What do they mean by the drinks didn't flow? There, there wasn't enough food drinks. Now, okay. And because of that, they forget everything else that was at the event. The fact that the drinks didn't flow, they didn't enjoy the event. Some two will come back and it will be all about the food that they ate. We'll talk about how the food didn't taste nice or perhaps how there was very limited variety in terms of the kind of food that were available. Is my making sense? Yes. So we realized that based on the few examples we just gave right now, Food and beverage play a key role in determining the kind of experience that the attendees at your event will have. And that is why we are treating this topic as part of our course. So food and beverage at events are an important component such that any effective event pro professional must put real thoughts into the food and beverage at their events. And that is what we are going to be doing in today's session by appreciating and understanding the level of thoughts that the event professional has to put into the food and beverage planning at their events. And it's not just about planning the availability and supply of the food and beverages, but it's also about monitoring and evaluating them at the functions that you organize. So it's not just enough for you to be able to determine how much food and beverage might be provided and ensure that they get there. You also need to monitor and evaluate how the food and beverage is distributed and how your event attendees react when they are consuming these foods and beverages at the event. 
because along the line during the event in in the process of consuming these food and beverages there are several issues that may come up which you as the event professional need to address in order to ensure that the attendees at the event have a pleasant experience so generally these are the things that we will be considering in today's session so now that we have appreciated this, we need to know the fact that the organization of catering and beverages varies considerably depending on the type of events that you are organizing and the venue that you are organizing it at. So generally, if you are organizing an event, you need to think about in terms of the food that you are serving and the beverage that you are serving, two types of services. For the food, we can talk about in-house catering, where the venue that you are booking for the event and the type of events that you're organizing determines the fact that you have to source the food or the catering from in-house, being from the, the venue that you are booking. So if you are holding the event at the banquet room of a hotel or the conference room of a hotel, Based on the nature of the venue and their requirements, you would have to go to what we refer to as in-house catering, where the hotel's kitchen or catering unit will provide the food that is required for the event. Whereas you may also have certain venues that do not have their own kitchen or catering unit that can provide you with the food that you're looking for. So you will have to engage in what we refer to as contracting outwards of the catering function, which means that you need to find an independent caterer to provide food for the event. Now, this is also largely dependent upon the type of venue that you are using, because some venues already have caterers that they work with. So you may not be free to choose your own caterer to bring to the venue. However, if you are able to find a venue that is not restricted, and allows you to choose whichever caterer you would prefer, then you are free to go ahead and choose a caterer that you prefer to be able to cater for your event at this particular venue that you have selected. So moving forward, we will be talking about the process of contracting food and beverage in-house and out-house. So like we explained for the food, it's the same for the beverages. If you have a venue that has a unit that provides beverages, they may prefer for you to source your beverages from them. However, if this, this venue does not have their own beverage provision unit, they can allow you to be able to go out and look for your own provider to provide the beverages that will be served to your attendees at the event. So in terms of contracting food and beverage in-house and out-house, you'll notice that most hotels and vendors have a purchasing agent or department that procures materials needed for production, including food and beverage. So like I mentioned, when we are talking about hotels, they have their own kitchen that is always stocked and ready to provide catering services, be it for hotel occupants or for event professionals who are using the hotel premises for various events. Now, in that regard, hotels use a system of par levels, right? Which refers to the fact that they have a certain amount of food and supplies that they always have in stock to be able to ensure that they can meet the catering needs of guests, both in-house and those who are walk-in. So in the event that an event professional approaches the hotel and decides to stage an event on their premises, due to these power levels, the hotel has to plan in advance to be able to accommodate the catering requirements of this particular event that is going to be organized on their premises. So in that case, these events, which usually require custom menus, will have to give the hotel more lead time to be able to purchase the required items that are necessary to cater for the event and arrange for these items to be delivered in time to enable the hotel to cater for the needs of attendees at this particular event. So if you are contracting in-house, usually because of the daily operations of the hotels, the chef or the vendor will usually prepare enough food 
to serve more than the guaranteed guest count. And this is because given that they know the number of attendees coming and they know that there's a probability that definitely the number of attendees may uh, anticipated for may exceed by a little bit or more, they have this range within which they are able to work such that they can prepare for some of this overflow as we refer to it by about three to 5% of the original number of attendees expected. So if you tell the hotel you are working with an attendance of 100 guests, they will prepare for about 5% more than that 100 to be able to ensure that everyone is appropriately taken care of. And this again is as a result of their power level system, where if your guests come and the number exceeds, they cannot use the food that they have prepared to serve their in-house clients to feed your guests at your event. So they will usually go ahead and include this 5% extra in addition to the number that you book for your events to ensure that in case there's an overflow, it will be adequately taken care of. However, the minimum amount you pay for the 100 is that which will be charged. And this extra 5% is incorporated into that fee that is charged for the 100 people. Now, in the case that all the 100 people do not show up and there are fewer than these 100 people, you will still have to pay for the 400 because that was the number of, of attendees that were guaranteed at the point of agreement between the venue and the event professional. So when we say the number of attendees that were guaranteed, we are simply referring to the final number of people that the event professional confirmed were attending the event. And this is for the purposes of arranging for the food and the preparation of the beverages, particularly in the events that it is the same vendor or service provider that is providing for the food as well as the beverages at the event. So these are a few of the issues we need to look into when it comes to contracting food and beverage in-house. Now, if it was being done out-house, it would have been a totally different story where you are not dealing with the same venue, but you are dealing with an independent vendor who specializes in either providing these food or providing these beverages. Now, just like we said, in terms of the guarantee and the fact that you have to give the venue lead time, to plan for the number of guests that you are expecting at your event and to adequately do so, given that they are the ones catering for the event in terms of food and beverage. You also have to do the same thing for if the food and beverage is being sourced out of house. And in that case, some out house vendors will usually ask for a guarantee to be made within 48 to 72 hours in advance of the event to enable them to order all that they need to cater for your event, as well as get the required or requisite staff to help see through the successful execution of the event. Now, depending on the vendor you are dealing with, this time could be extended or reduced. So for some vendors, they'll give you as much as one week. Your deadline to give them the final list of of guests that are attending will be one week to the event because they want to ensure that they have enough time to source all the raw material and the inputs needed to be able to serve the required menu of food and beverage at your event. And sometimes, even if this guarantee that you are supposed to make is supposed to be made one week in advance of the event, it may sometimes come at a fee especially when you want to increase the number of, of attendees from what was originally agreed upon. However, if the number that was originally agreed upon, which you paid for, by the deadline of your guarantee has been reduced, depending on the kind of vendor that you are dealing with, they may not give you a refund for the extra number of attendees who are no longer showing up. And this is referred to as attrition. So if we experience any attrition in terms of the number of attendees, which we may have already paid the vendor for to provide food 
and beverage services. The vendor, based on their policy, may decide not to refund the excess amounts relating to those attendees who are going to be no-shows at the event. So again, in terms of contracting food in-house and out-of-house, this is another set of policies that the firm who is the event organizer needs to take into consideration, particularly in choosing the vendor to be able to provide the food and beverage and preparing themselves in terms of budget to deal with the repercussions of various changes that may or may not be made to the food and beverage menu or the list of attendees in that regard. Okay, so with that being said, let's look at sample food and beverage contracts for in-house and out and see how they compare to each other. Is, is that okay? Yes, sir. Given that we have talked about the fact that when you are contracting the food and beverage in-house, it is different from when you are contracting it from an independent vendor externally. So I'm quickly opening the in-house contract and the out-house contract, and then we will compare the two. Okay, so this is a sample. Sorry, please, can you see the screen? No, no, no. Okay, please, can you see it now? Yes, we can. Good. So this is an in-house catering contract for a venue known as Bistro, right? And they are some kind of restaurant slash event space where you can book for various events. Now this is their in-house con contract and you can see the specifics of the contract in terms of their requirements with regard to people who want to use their space to organize events. So here you see the first thing they ask for is the name of the customer. Then they ask for the organization that you are with. Then they ask for a telephone number, an email address, and then the type of events that you are organizing. Then they ask for the date of the function. And then the time at which you are expecting your guests to arrive. And then the time at which you are expecting the dinner or the lunch to start. And then the departure time. They want you to indicate each of these. These are very, very important. For instance, why do you think they will ask for the dinner slash lunch time? So they can prepare the food at a particular time and then make it available before. Good. And why do you also think they'll, they'll want to know about the arrival time? Uh, the same way to also know when they will be coming and then if Good. there is. Good. So that happening. way, if there's any food that does not travel well, or does not stay long after it is cooked, mm -hmm. they can time its cooking such that it will coincide with the arrival time so that it will not be cooked and sit there long enough to get spoiled. Yeah. Great. Then they also ask for the estimated number of guests, which is very, very important, right? So this once yeah. it's agreed upon will end up becoming the guaranteed number of guests who are expected to attend the event. Yeah. Then it goes on to talk about the general information and policies, and it reads as follows. Our professional resources in culinary and service skills afford you complete assurance that all of our commitments will be carried out to your absolute satisfaction. In order to ensure you and your guests of a well-organized function, we must ask that we both adhere to the following catering policies. One, guarantee policy. Please keep us aware of any changes in the event attendance, whether it means attrition or increase in numbers. Do you see that? So that you knew yeah. where to be learned have all been used here. Yes. Good. Then they also say that the final guarantee is given when? How many hours prior to the event? Um, 28. 48 mm -hmm. hours. So that's two okay. days to the event. Good and will be the minimum number you will be charged for. So it means that 48 hours to the event, the number of attendees that you guarantee is the minimum number you will be charged for. However, they agree that there's a possibility they can charge you more. That's why they, they took the pain to write 
minimum number. Do you see that? Yes. There's a chance that that number will increase. Assuming during the event, they observe that the number you guaranteed 48 hours ago has significantly increased. Please, does that make sense? Yes, Doc. Good. Now, in terms of the payment and retainer fees, they also said that billing arrangements for all events must be made in accordance with catering policies. There is a 20% retainer fee on all events. Unless prior arrangements have been agreed to in writing by owner, then they write the name of the owner. So it means any other agreement you have with any other person is invalid, isn't it? Yes. Good. Then they said payment in full is due no later than 48 hours prior to the event. So that means that when you tell them you want to organize your event there, you have to pay upfront 20% of the amount to guarantee that you are serious about using their, their venue for your event. Then when you, are when you are finalizing the guaranteed number of attendees, you will pay the rest of the amount and pay everything in full, which should be 48 hours prior to the event. And their policy says that if payment is not received by this time, all contractual obligations are what? Nullified. Nullified. And no refunds are what? Due. Due. So if you don't pay, they will not refund your 20% and all the contract agreements you had in the beginning are nullified. And they said payments may be made by cash, check, or charge card. Then they have a policy with regard to cancellation. They said if a client cancels a contracted food and beverage event and or facility, the caterer will retain the retainer fee as liquidated damages. The yeah. 20%. Good. They'll keep it as damages. Hmm. If the date can be rescheduled by another client, a refund may be permitted because that means that they'll get the money from another client. So they'll refund okay. you. But if they don't get another client, they'll keep the money as damages. Mm. However, if they do not also keep it, you can agree to make the deposit be applied to a future event. But that event should be scheduled within one calendar year from the original contract date. Yeah. These people are quite flexible. Yes, I think this is fine. Yeah, they give you several no, options. Yes. They yes. didn't give you one month. Yeah, they said one year. But for some organizations, yeah. they don't even give you time to reschedule. Once you cancel, the damages are for them. Even if they get another client to, to book the space for that period, they will not give you your refund. So these people's contract is quite flexible. And it goes on to talk about leftover food. See, they said leftover food will be released to what? Designated persons only if a signed liability release form is on file 48 hours prior to the event with instructions for release. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So they'll not just allow people to be packing the food and taking it home anyhow. They will only give the leftovers to specific people that have been designated 48 hours prior to the event, just like their agreement on the final number of guests. And they said there are no exceptions to this rule. We apologize in advance for any for any inconvenience the policy affords, but our insurance company demands that we adhere to this policy strictly. And that's because if there's leftover food and it's given to anybody and everybody, and something happens as a result of consuming that leftover food, they'll be held responsible. And you realize that they have other provisions in terms of service and gratuity, substitutions, restaurant buyout and rental fees, and then alcohol policy. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So they are telling you in, in booking them to organize your event that they also have what? A full beer, wine, and liquor to offer. So that means they have a fully stocked bar. And you could also choose a hosted bar at a per person cost of alcohol plus a bartender hourly fee of $25. So if you want to have a bar at your event 
which they are supposed to do for you. In this case, is it in-house or out-house? In-house. In-house. They'll charge you $25 per person. Huh. And this comes with all the alcohol the person can drink and the services of a bartender. And okay. you can only book it for a minimum of four hours. So you can't say you are booking the, the beverage service for one hour. It's not possible. That is if you are using the hosted bar concept where you are paying for the alcohol and the bartender. Right? So if you are paying minimum of $25 per person per hour and you can only do a minimum of four hours, that means that you have to pay how much per head? How much per head? $50. No, how much per head? You can only do minimum four hours. Okay. So how much per head? Hundred. Hundred, yeah. So in Ghana here, you realize that this is the option that most people go for. They pay for their drinks in advance and people can just drink as much as they want. However, abroad, there's an option called a cash bar where the bar is available, but the event organizers or the event commissioners do not pay for the services of the bartender and the alcohol that you consume. So you come to the event with your own money to pay for your own beverages. I've never seen this happen at an event in Ghana before. If it has, it's not very common. Because almost every event I've attended in Ghana, the beverages are free for everybody to drink, isn't it? Isn't that the case? In yes. Ghana, the alcohol is always free, isn't it? Sure. Uh, yes, the alcohol and the drinks are free. If you, you organize an event in Ghana, you make it a cash bar, nobody will come. <laughs> Even if they come and they find out, they'll leave very early. Because it is the alcohol that they drink that keeps them engaged and keeps them happy, that makes them stay on at the event for long hours. At least depending on the type of event you are organizing. If it is a, an event where you'll be hosting a lot of alcohol drinkers, then you should expect that kind of response. <laughs> yes. As part of their policy, they also say that they will not charge children under the age of 10. So whatever the children eat or drink, they will not charge them. That does not mean that you should go and be greedy and say that your attendees, about 30 of them are children, when you know that is a lie. <laughs> and we can see the policy also talks about taxes. Right, so they're saying that all the figures that they give you in terms of what you have to pay include per person charges of tax. Right, so at the bottom, you see the, the signature of the client and the date, and then that of the caterer and the date. So, this is a typical in house catering contract. Right, now let's look at an outhouse one. So, this one is an independent food contractor or food caterer for an event. And this is their catering contract. So they start by asking the name of the person, the date, the contact person, if it is different from the name of the person who is contracting them, and then the phone number and email of this contact person. Then the date of the function and the type of function it is. And they even go ahead to ask whether it is a surprise function or not. Because if it's a surprise function, like a surprise party, there's a way they will have to handle it as against it not being a surprise function. Then they also ask about the number of guests. And they said, if it is a buffet you want to have, the guaranteed minimum of number of guests required for them to come and do a buffet for you is what number of people? What number of people? What's the minimum number of event attendees you need for them to come and cater your event? for a buffet. Hello? I, no, it's 40. 40, yes. Yes, please. And they will not spend longer than four hours at your event. 
So between the starting time of your event and when the food must be served, as well as the end time, it should all take a maximum of four hours. Then you also have to indicate the package of the menu that you are choosing. For an independent food vendor like this, they would have different menu packages depending on your budget and your requirements. So you have to indicate the menu package you have chosen and then also indicate any additional options that you would require. Now you realize that this is a caterer that will also provide for you beverage services if you so require. So they'll ask here in the contract whether you want wine at your tables. If yes, you have to refer to the wine list to tell them the kind of wine you're looking for. If no, you also have to tell them that. So in that case, you have to indicate whether you want soda pitchers, alcoholic punch, non-alcoholic punch, a cash bar, which you just learned about, a tab bar. Tab bar means that there's a limit the event commissioners have paid for people to drink, but there's a limit that they have paid for. So once you reach that limit, you have end, you have closed your tab. Does that make sense? Yes. So with a tab bar, you are not paying for it, but the, the event organizers have paid for a certain number of drinks for you. So as long as you have not consumed that number of drinks, your tab is open. As soon as you consume all the drinks, your tab is closed. Right? And then you should also indicate whether you want no bar at all. Then you also have to indicate the linen color choices, the choices you want them to cover the tables with. Right? So they, they are indicating that they only have circle linen in white and champagne. So you choose one of them. And the napkin colors too that they have, they are only circle napkins and they come in white, champagne, blue, forest green, mauve, and then if you have any other one that they have not in indicated here that you want, you have to indicate it. And then you also have to tell them if you'll be coming in to decorate yourself or and what time you'll be doing so. Otherwise, they will do the decoration for you. And then do you want a cake table? Do you want a gift table? Do you want a podium? Depending on the type of event that you're organizing. And then you also have to indicate, would you like candle lamps? So you realize that this is an organization that does not only do in-house catering, they also do outhouse. So this contract can fit both in-house and outhouse. Do you realize? Because Brothers Restaurant have their own venue. But if you do not want to use their venue too and you are using an independent venue and you want them to come there to serve you, they can do so. And they go on to even indicate whether you need music, right? And how you want this music. You want a DJ, would you use the radio or you bring your own CDs for them to play? And all this go on to end with the signature of the, of the people who are signing the contracts, the amount that they deposited and the days that the deposit was made. So this is a typical example of a contract that is primarily looks like an out house contract, but can also serve as an in-house contract because of the way the owners of the, of the vending service, being Brothers Restaurant, have designed it. Please, does that make sense? Yes, please. Okay. So let's look at the nature of food and beverage at events. You realize that as an event professional, there are certain things you need to consider when it comes to food and beverage at events, right? The first thing you need to think about is the number of people. Because without knowing the number of people, you will not know the adequate levels of food and beverage that you need to have in order to ensure that they have a great experience. You also need to think about the different times that your attendees or your guests will be refreshed. In some events, there's only one time that is dedicated to eating and drinking. So it is at specific times during the event and you have to let your, your food and beverage providers know this so that they can prepare adequately. For other events too, the provision of food and beverage is consistent throughout the event from start to finish, such that as soon as guests start arriving, they start serving all manner of food and beverage. They usually start with appetizers, isn't it? They usually start with appetizers, isn't it? Yes, please. Good. 
and then they'll go to the main course and then they'll do some dessert. But you realize that the food will be flowing and be served throughout the period of the event. Again, as an event professional, you need to think about the budget that you have been allocated for the event, particularly the part of the budget that you have to spend on food and beverages, because this will determine the extent that you can go when you are ordering the food and beverages for your attendees at the event. And then finally, as an event professional, you also need to think about the attendees themselves, because event attendees have peculiar characteristics and features. That as an event professional, you need to take cognizance of when planning for the food and beverage at these events, which we will get more in detail uh, information about in the subsequent slides. However, one of the main issues of catering at events, which I want us to take cognizance of, particularly in relation to the attendees, is the insensitivity towards the type of people attending events. And this happens a lot when it comes to events like those organized in, in Ghana where you see that for every event that you attend, be it a wedding or a funeral, there's a certain menu that is served. At least, at best, you will see certain food items that are consistent in every menu, regardless of whether it is a party, a wedding, or a funeral. Do you agree? Do you agree? Yes, please. What are some of these menu items? So, There's, in my opinion, there's no specification, but uh, some people don't like certain food items. To be no, added. no, no, no. What I'm asking is that in yeah. Ghana here, regardless of what you are saying in terms of some people not liking certain food items, there are okay. certain foods that are constant on every menu for almost every event in Ghana. Yeah. Rice, it's a wedding, funeral, exactly. Rice, rice dishes. Mm -hmm. So jollof, curry rice, Fried rice, plain rice, and vegetable chicken. rice, spaghetti rice. Should I continue? Chicken, chicken, and go. Chicken and go. Yeah, the rice dishes are almost always there, but they do not think about people who necessarily do not like the items on these base menus that they use for every single event. Right? People have never asked themselves that question. And that is one of the key things we are going to consider and look into when it comes to event professionals focusing on the attendees at these events and the nature of food and beverage as is determined by the characteristics of these attendees. So we are going to break these down in the subsequent slides to appreciate how the event professional needs to consider each of these factors. So in terms of the nature of food, I don't, I, uh, yes. I don't know if you, if you touch the budget area. Yes, I talked about the budget. I talked about the fact that you should take cognizance of the part of your budget that is allocated to food and beverage. Okay. Okay. Because you know the budget has a lot of other items on it. Yes. So you need to know how much has been allocated for you to be able to spend on food and beverage, to be able to know how far you can go okay. when you are requesting for specific food and beverage for your event. Because you know different food and beverage items come at a different cost. So for instance, if I decide to serve seafood as part of the food at my event, it will have cost implications. It will be, high, high, It'll be higher high than expensive. if I decide to serve chicken or beef. The same for beverages. If I decide to serve champagne and rosé, it will be more expensive than if I decide to serve Coke and Fanta, isn't it? That's true. Yeah. So that is essentially what I was saying in relation to the budget. Good. So let's look specifically at the nature of food at events, particularly as it relates to buffet spreads. And you realize that buffet spreads are very popular in events organizing these days. Virtually every event uses the buffet approach, isn't it? Good. Now there are two types of buffets. We have the finger buffet and the fork buffet. The finger buffet is where you usually do not require guests to have a sit-down meal, but they can stand around and pick these food items and consume them on the go, right? And these buffets are usually made up of different varieties of finger foods that, like I said, guests can easily pick up and eat 
while they are walking around and having conversation and do not necessarily require a sit down setup involving plates and forks and spoons, right? So what are some finger buffet items that we can serve? Um, friend, uh, uh, biscuits. Is, biscuits. Is yeah. And all yeah. the different pastries that we have. Yes. The meat pies, sausage mm. rolls, uh, quiche, sausages. good sausages, mm. and uh, gizzard. Sandwich. Sandwiches, good. These mm. are all finger buffet foods. Mm. Right? But beyond the finger buffet, we can talk about the fork buffet, which requires more of a sit down setup. And these foods are not foods that you can easily pick up and eat on the go. They are foods that you need to sit down and take your time to consume. And these could either be served hot, cold, or both. Right? So fork buffet items can include anywhere from the, all the rice dishes we've talked about to seafood, to all the carbs, banku, fufu, tilapia. All of these can be added to a fork buffet. Now you realize that depending on how much you have to spend, you need to consider as an event professional a juxtaposition of high cost buffet food items to lower cost buffet food items. So when it, in terms of Ghanaian diets, for instance, you will realize that when they create these buffets, the rice dishes are more than the other more expensive buffet food items like banku and tilapia. True or false? It's true. It's true. If they have a seafood element on the buffet, it will be in very limited supply than the other low cost items. You well, will also, mother, yes. I want, I want to find out as an event professional. Yes. When, when high uh, dignitaries, for example, are attending an event, uh, what is the technique in determining the kind of food they may like? What okay, so what I know from experience is that we write to them in advance. Uh, okay, okay. And then we ask for their meal preferences. Okay. So they'll tell us the beverages that they like. And this one is usually done by their executive assistants. Okay. So the executive assistants will write back or will give you a phone call to tell you what drinks they prefer and then their meal preferences. If they have any allergies, which we'll, we'll talk a bit about a bit more about later, they'll tell you about all these things. But the practice is to formally write to them, thanking them for their acceptance of your invitation and then requesting for this information to help you serve them better when they attend the event. Asim, I hope that answers your question. Yes, please. Thank you very much. All right. So like I said, in terms of designing the buffet, as event professionals, you will notice that to be able to work within the budgets that we are often given, you will have to juxtapose the inclusion of lower cost buffet items with high cost buffet items so that there will be a balance. And then you can work within your budgets and still provide a buffet that will be attractive and respectable for the kind of events that you're organizing. So low cost buffet items could include salads and breads, which we realize are also very common in Ghanaian buffets, right? As well as the rice dishes and the chicken dishes, which are also very common because of their low cost element. And you notice that these low cost items are often placed first on the table. And the high cost items are often placed last or they will be available, but in limited quantities, such that once the high cost items are finished, they are finished. Have you experienced that before? So they'll just bring small banku and tilapia. And then once it's finished, it's finished. And sometimes they'll even limit your, your consumption by telling you that you can't pick the tilapia and we're using it to eat rice. Have you experienced that before? Yeah, they'll tell you that the, bank, the tilapia goes strictly with the banku. So if you are not eating banku, don't pick any tilapia. These are all ways by which they try to manage the high cost buffet items in conjunction with the lower cost buffet items to ensure that they are able to create some of a pleasurable experience for event attendees using the buffet food items. So these are the two kinds of buffet that you can put together for your event, depending on the nature of your event and what its objectives are. So for instance, for an event like 
um, uh, Harriet event that involves power changing hands, they cannot do a finger buffet. The media will go and write a story and say that ECG brought them all the way to um, is this century and was not able to even give them food to eat. All they did was give them finger food and make them stand around. So you realize that in that case, a finger buffet will not be appropriate, isn't it? Harriet. Is she there? Harriet, are you there? Wow, okay. But you realize that in the case of Harriet's event, a finger buffet will not be appropriate. Yes, please. The same for Balfour's event. Balfour's event celebrating cocoa farmers. The nature of the event alone Finger buffet will not be appropriate, isn't it? That's true. Good. But for your event, Cassie, looking at the nature of your event and yes. the kind of attendees that you have, a finger buffet will be the most appropriate, isn't it? That's true. Great. All right. So that is it for the nature of food and how we can use buffets as part of the events that we organize. Now, moving beyond the, the, the way the food is displayed and spread and the and we need to talk about the composition of the food as well. Now, this is where specifically we are looking at the menu items and the range of foods. I think we talked a bit about it when we're talking about the range of foods provided in the Ghanaian buffets, right? But on a more serious note, we need to focus on the fact that the nature of the menu and its composition depends to a large extent on the kind of attendees that you have. And therefore, you need to be able to find a vendor that is capable of providing the variety composed in your menu. Such that if you write to dignitaries and they tell you about certain food items, they, they won't be included in the menu. And the current vendor that you are working with is incapable of providing those food items. Then you need to stop working with that vendor and find another vendor who can be able to provide those menu items because you need those items to be able to keep your dignitaries happy. So you realize that because most of the caterers and food providers that we have, particularly in the Ghanaian context, have limited capabilities, they tend to lean more towards standardized and rather predictable menus, which are convenient. Do you realize that? Yes. Yes, and that is very popular in Ghana here. Because the, most of the caterers in Ghana do not have the, the um, capabilities required to cook some of the more exotic menus like we experience at some of the four-star and five-star hotels that work with more international chefs who have more experience and higher levels of capability. So you realize that these vendors with lower levels of capability and skill would usually specialize in standardized and predictable menus, which may not be able to serve the needs of each of our attendees, especially where we have certain special attendees like dignitaries who have already sent in advance their specifications and requirements of the foods that they want to see on the menu for their consumption, right? So in that case, how do we plan our menu to be able to ensure that it caters for all the attendees or the different classes of attendees at the event that we organize. Harriet. Oh, it's broken your wall. Oh, sorry, God. Harriet. Like, I, oh, oh, I don't know. Oh, what to sorry. Say. Please go and <laughs> attend to it. Eh? Yes, I, I, I'm taking the phone with me. So I'll put it on, okay. on me so I, I don't make noise. All right. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that, Harriet. Harriet, what happened to you? Some, some car, I don't know, the car was passed. I think it was loaded with. Uh... So like I was saying, let's talk about menu planning and how to be able to go about it to ensure that each of our attendees is adequately taken care of. So when it comes to menu planning, you always have to think about what is included in the menu that you are going to serve to your attendees. Now, this will usually involve starting from the point of a standardized menu which you can either decide to retain or redesign or add a few items or decide that you will go ahead and accommodate what the client is proposing rather than building from your own standardized menu. 
that you can either redesign or add on. So before you go about adopting your standardized menu or redesigning it to suit the taste of a particular client or adding a few menu items to make it more tailored towards the needs of your client or deciding to leave your menu altogether and adopting a new menu that the client themselves is requesting for, for their event, you need to evaluate the nature and characteristics of each of your event attendees. So here, what are we saying? We are saying that each of your event attendees has a unique profile. And this profile is made up of their different characteristics which can influence their consumption patterns and how they experience different kinds of food and beverage. And as a result, as an event professional, you need to evaluate them and create profiles for each of them, which will influence the food and beverage options that you decide to include as part of your event organizing process. Now, this attendee evaluation may include the average age of the attendees, right? Whether they are children, whether they are teenagers, middle-aged people, or old people. The gender of the people too is necessary, whether they are male or female. You also need to think about religion because you realize that for certain religions, certain food items are a no-go area. Hatim, are you a Muslim? Yes, please. That means you don't eat pork. I've never tasted it and I don't know when I shall taste it. Good, mm -hmm. right? And there are certain other foods too that you, your, your religion does not permit you to eat, isn't it? I've never tasted alcohol before in my Good. life. Good, right? So these are all the things that as an event professional, you need to consider. If there are Muslims attending, you need to consider them in your menu. And That's if you are even, and if you are serving food that they do not like, make sure you serve it in such a way that it will not make the other foods disgusting to them. It's true. So what I about want, events? Yes, Kasim, go ahead. No, I wanted to say that me, for example, if I go to an area that is not my normal area, yeah. uh, if I want to buy kebab, I yes. first of all ask them, do you have uh, pork? If the answer is yes, the guy is disqualified. Yes, because he, it means he prepared them all at the same time uh -huh. on the same fire yes. at the same place. Good. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I go to a buffet and they have served the food and you, the event professional, know that Muslims will be there, then you put the rice right next to the pork meat and you mix all the food together on one table, it means you don't want the Muslims to eat. That's true. So you have to be able to separate the food such that it will be served in a way that will not be appalling or off-putting to the people who do not eat certain kinds of food. Right? So religion is very, very important as one of the, the criteria for evaluating your attendees. Diet restrictions are also things that you need to consider. For instance, there are certain people who do not eat certain kinds of food, sometimes because of a medical condition, like diabetics. We can also talk about people who also based on allergies do not consume certain kinds of food. These are all diet restrictions. There are other people too who are just on a diet generally to lose weight. Yes. So because of that, there are certain foods that they will not eat. Like me, for instance, I don't eat fufu at all. I don't eat kenke at all. Wow. I can't remember the last time I tasted banku. Wow. Yes, because of my own personal diet restrictions. Okay, okay. So you need to also think about this and ask your attendees in advance. So usually when attendees are asked to bring an RSVP, as part of the RSVP, you need to be able to tell the event planner what you eat and what you do not eat, what you drink and what you do not drink, and what you can and cannot accommodate as a guest at this particular event. Then we also have people who, based on their lifestyle and attitudes, have adopted a certain approach to eating. For instance, we are seeing an, the onset of a lot of different kinds of, of people in terms of eating based on their psychographics. Like we have the vegetarians who based on their lifestyles and their attitudes and perceptions about the world, do not consume any meat products. So if you are having an event and you know there will be vegetarians there, there should be a menu that has been created specifically for the vegetarians. And I didn't know much about vegetarianism until I realized that it goes as far as even the oil that you use to cook the food. 
if you are sauteing any manner of vegetables and you are using an oil, it better be a plant-based oil. And it shouldn't be oil that has been used to fry anything else that is close to meat. Then we have the pescatarians, those who only eat the seafood and the fish. All right. And these are just a few of the variations of people who eat based on their lifestyles, attitudes, and beliefs. So as an event professional, you need to pay close attention to each of your attendees and whether or not they fit into any of these groups. Now, these are just a few of the groups. We can even put the attendees into more groups. Assuming we decide to break these groupings down into different sub-levels and add other groupings. So, so menu uh, planning, yes, Kasim. Yeah, so I'm just wondering, um, the Ghanaian way of organizing events such as wedding, mm -hmm. when when sometimes you don't know the demographic and psychographic characteristics of the attendees. Good. Mostly the men, the man side will invite the, 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 the side of the man will invite their own people. Yes. You invite your friend and your friend also invite his friend and his friend. Then right. the woman side too. So it, it's, it's not difficult to actually um, segregate these people and then make appropriate a decision based on food choice. Exactly. So in that case, what is the technique involved uh, in this case, madam? That's why you realize that they, they, they skew more towards the standardized menu, mm. where yes. they have a basic set of food items that regardless of your background, you'll find something in there okay. that you can consume. But for other consumers in different parts of the world, it is rude to not RSVP to their event, one. Okay. And in RSVP, you should be able to tell them your specific requirements. Mm. So when you get crashed somebody's event abroad, it is rude. They see it as okay. being very rude because that means they do not know about this person and they do not have the chance to adequately prepare for this person okay. to accommodate their, diff their needs at this particular event. I think it's more of a cultural thing. Okay. So in Ghana, everybody believes that people eat banku and rice. So Thank they you. Will just prepare regardless. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Everybody eats chicken and fish. Yes. Everybody likes salad. So they'll do Ghana salad and then they'll do some spaghetti salad and then they'll do some Greek salad and then they are done. Mm -hmm. Then they'll put a salad cream and ketchup on the side with baked beans. But generally, that's what everybody will consume. Right? However, as, as a professional event organizer, this is not the standard that you're expected to operate at. Right? Because for you, it's more of a career and not a pastime. So you need to do things the right way by actively profiling your attendees finding out from the event commissioner whether they are expecting some high profile people that they want you to pay close attention to. Then you have the responsibility of contacting these people personally and obtaining information from them regarding what their specifications are in terms of seating, in terms of eating, in terms of beverage, to ensure that you give them the proper treatment that they deserve, right? So attendee evaluation is very important as an event professional when you are planning your menu and the beverages that you are going to serve. So in terms of the individual characteristics, we talked about diet restrictions earlier, and I mentioned that it includes people who are on special diets for different reasons, right? So like I said, for instance, for the people who for personal reasons do not consume certain food items, and for others who for health reasons have been advised to stay away from certain food items, you, the event professional, have to make sure that all of these people are catered for in your final menu that you agree upon with your client, right? A typical example here is the senior citizens who usually, based on their age, have certain health conditions that do not allow them to eat exotic foods or perhaps heavy foods or spicy foods. So you need to find out how many of such people will be present at your event and what they can and, and, and cannot handle. Now, other forms of special diets that can influence your many include, like I said, people who have allergic reactions to certain kinds of food. And then we also have the diabetic patients. 
And then those who have high blood pressure, who cannot consume a lot of salt or sodium, right? So we have the high cholesterol people. Then we also have the lactose intolerant people. These are all kinds of people who are on special diets based on various physiological and medical conditions. Now, for a lot of these, they are very easy to plan for as part of your menu. Because like I said, if someone is lactose intolerant, you need to be able to make sure that in the event you are serving ice cream, you provide an option that is lactose free. In the event that you are serving food to a high cholesterol patient, you need to be able to ensure that the food items and the way they are combined or cooked do not exacerbate their cholesterol problem. For those with high blood pressure, there is the way you are supposed to prepare their food. Likewise, those who have diabetes. However, the more difficult one to be able to plan for in a menu is that of the allergic reactions that different attendees may have to food items. Now, the, the, there are lots of caterers, particularly in our context, who, for some reason, are not even aware that people have different allergies to certain food items. Who in this class knew that people react to food items? Who did not yes, know that yes, they do they do react before you knew okay yes. Kasim, you also know yes please. yeah i also know yeah jifa is a caterer so she would know but some people do not know right and yeah. sometimes it's as a result of the fact that it is a very specialized area and someone who is very expert at their craft who will be able to be cognizant of such variations in terms of event attendees. And I dare say that even for those who know about these allergic reactions, they do not know the different groups of allergies. True or false? But what do you know the different groups of allergies? Oh. If I what about you? No, I don't. Good, right? So you, you, even for those of you who know that people can react to certain foods or they are allergic to certain things, you do not know the different kinds of allergies that there are, right? I've only come across the very strict vegetarian. Good. So the vegetarian is not an allergic, it's not a response to an allergy. It's the, a no, life strict. Yeah. The vegetarianism is a lifestyle choice. Mm -hmm. Do you get it? Yeah. So it's not because they are allergic to anything meat, but because based on their choice and the way they want to live their life, they do not want to consume any meat. And that's likely yeah, they, because of what they believe. Okay, this this prices. one, this one, even when you use um, a ladle to pick fish, and then use it to take anything for them, there's a group of men like that. Do we? Yes, exactly. They will not. They will not eat the food. I think we discussed mm -hmm. it earlier, but you had not mm -hmm. joined us then. Kasim, you remember we were talking about it? Yes. Yes. Good. Like someone who sells kebab and then roasts mm -hmm. the pork and the beef on the same griddle? More, more times I go, when I go to buy, I just ask the person first, do you sell pork here? Once the person say yes, he's disqualified, I won't buy. Good. So even though I, I don't like pork, I psychologically ask the person, do you have good. pork? Good, good. Yes, I won't buy. Good, because it goes back to what Jifa is saying, isn't it? Mm, yeah. The ladle or the, 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 the is it the, I, I call it oh. the griddle. But whatever it is that you are you are cooking the meat with will end up touching the pork and touching all the other kinds of meat, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Good, right? So in terms of allergies, there are eight common food allergies that exist. Right. So today I'm teaching you something new. Yeah. So we have the dairy allergy, right? And then we have egg allergy. Then peanut allergy, which is very common. Then we have allergies to tree nut. Then we have seafood allergy. This one too is also quite common. Then we have the soy allergy. Can you believe that? Soy being that they, they usually tout as the healthier option. There are people who are allergic to it. Then there are people who also have wheat allergies. And then carmine allergy. So these are the three main groups of allergies that exist. So as an event professional, when you are profiling your attendees, you need to be able to find out from them if they fall within any of these common allergy groups. 
Please, does that make sense? Yes, please. Good. If they fall into any of these groups, then you know that you have to be able to ensure that your food items do not contain any of these sources of allergy. Even if some of the items contain a potential source of allergy, there should be a menu option that they can conveniently opt for, which would not make them have that allergic reaction. Please, does that make sense? Yes, please. Good. So if you are having a buffet and you know there are people coming with seafood allergies and peanut allergies and dairy allergies, it means that there should be menu options for those who don't eat seafood. And there should be many options for those who don't consume peanuts. So those who have weddings and then the starters that they put on the every table is peanuts. Every time I see it, I get angry. If I've seen that thing before. Yes. They put peanuts in a bowl and then they put it in the middle of the table. Yeah, so everybody picks. Everybody picks. Have you considered those who have peanut allergy? <laughs> Then some people will go ahead thinking that they are doing variety. They'll provide uh, plantain chips and, and peanuts, yeah. but they'll mix it. Yeah. They'll mix it. So I'm like, ah. because me like this, I have peanut allergy. Oh, okay. So I'll not go anywhere near something that has nuts. So you've mixed the plantain chips with the nuts. So what am I supposed to pass? Mm. So you realize that the smart caterers or event professionals will usually provide a bowl that has two sections. Yes. And yes. then they'll put the nuts on one side and then put the, the uh, plantain chips on the other side. The when other I see side that, side. I smile. Because yes, they're thinking about those who are allergic to the other side. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Jipa, it's funny. You're remembering all those events you attended and they did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I come and it's like that, I will know that I will not stay long. Within the next how many minutes, pa, I'm gone. Because I can see that I'm not welcome there. You are not thinking about me. Right? So as an event professional, you need to think about these things when you are choosing your menu options. With the background you have about your attendees, you need to make sure that everybody is catered for in there. Such that if there is, there is something that will affect a particular attendee, you should give them a convenient option that they will equally enjoy. That will not make them feel left out. So today we've learned something new about the eight common food allergies, right? Which will constitute a key part in the selection of your menu items for any events that you are organizing, right? So examples of food menu items that we will usually see are proteins, which are often an option to the seafood. So you will see um, the lean beef, right? The skinless chicken. In Ghana here, we don't even have lean beef or skinless chicken. It's either beef, goat, or chicken, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> you choose which one works for you. And then for the very high-end buffets, you will see some seafood. But seafood is not very common in every buffet. Yeah. Yeah. Then we it's see, expensive. yes, it's expensive, my dear. Good point. So you would, you would rarely see seafood in, in Ghanaian buffets, but you will see a lot of beef, goat, and chicken. And then you also see sausages. And fish. And fish. <laughs> then you see the calves, right? A lot of rice. Mm. And then depending on how much the person wants to spend, you will see some fufu with goat's light soup yeah. or banku and tilapia. Oh, okay. Or banku and okro. The okro would have all the encomiums, the crab, Crabs, the wele, <laughs> the, <laughs> the tuna, the tuna the everything. <laughs> <laughs> Once in a while, depending on the event, you will see some pasta on the table. Yeah. Or some, some uh, spaghetti bolognese. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or you see some pasta salad, depending on who you are dealing with. But it's not very common. Mm. And some people too will provide some bread to go with the salad. But again, that is also not very common. common yeah. The salad is usually provided to go with the rice. Mm. Either the fried rice or the jollof rice. Uh -huh. <laughs> then we have the, the fats, which are also not very common in Ghanaian um, uh, buffets. You will not see butter being provided with bread at a buffet. No, whipped cream, no. 
But you see heavy salad dressing, like salad cream with um, mm. baked beans and corn. Yeah, I wonder why people do all that combination. Hey, it's so called Ghana least, salad. <laughs> That's the, the difference, you see? Ghana salad and uh, 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 other salads, Jipa. I hate it. Oh, at least separate all that with the baked beans, fine. Then you give us the creams and things on the side. Thank you. Don't they don't consider everything. Thank you. Keep it on the sun. And then after a it while, it's what taste. Tea. Good. The ones I hate is the ones that even mix the sardine. Have you seen that one? They mix uh, sardine yeah. with the leaves and everything. <laughs> oh my God. What if someone doesn't like the smell of sardine? I know people who don't eat sardine. Mm. Right. So, like Jifa is saying, as a responsible learning professional, you talk to your caterer and say, please separate these items because the people I'm expecting, some may not like the sardine. Some may not like the salad dressing. They may opt for, for lighter forms of dressing. Some people like this vinegar dressing. Yeah. So you have to have it on the side. You have to have it on the side. I think as yeah, a professional, you shouldn't be told on about that. You yeah, should. But as the event professional, Jifa, you know that you cannot trust every vendor to do the yeah. right thing. Yes. So you have mm -hmm. to put your foot down. This is your event. Mm -hmm. You need yeah. to take charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You see, that's why some event professionals will only work with certain vendors because mm -hmm. they have come to the vendors have come to know their style. Mm -hmm. So if I'm, I'm I'm catering for Jifa's event, I know this is what Jifa expects of me, yeah. and I'll do just that. Yeah, I'm always so careful of poisoning because this exactly. thing, the least thing, you have food poisoning. Exactly, and they will take you and on. You have people seeing you here and there, yeah. driving you, yeah. social media and all that. So I'm very careful when it comes to these things. Yeah. See, but a lot of, 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 of the professionals in our industry, like we said, are not that experienced. So here's the case where you, the experienced ones, being the event yeah. professionals, have to put your foot down and let them know the standard that you are expecting. And make mm. sure that they, they work up to that standard. Mm. All right. So that is it for our menu planning. Now let's talk about our beverage planning. Already we've discussed a bit about beverage planning when we talked about the cash bar, right? The tab bar, and then the open bar, right? So for the benefit of those who were not with us at that, at that point, we said that a cash bar is where there's a bar, but the event organizers are not paying for people's consumption of alcohol and drinks. So the bar is there. If you, the event attendee, want to get a drink, you need to pay for it yourself and drink it. A tap bar, on the other hand, is where the event organizers are paying for your drinks, but they are only paying up to a certain number of drinks or up to a certain amount. So the amount that they are paying for is what we refer to as the tab. So uh, as long as you have not consumed the amount that has been allocated to you, your tab will still be open. As soon as you reach your limits, the tab will be closed. Whereas for an open bar, the event organizers are paying for everything. So you can drink as much as you want and nobody will hold you accountable. Now in Ghana here, it is very rare for you to see a cash bar or a tab bar at an event. You don't take it, they'll insult you for several months mm. for making them dress up and come to your events and also come and pay for drinks. So almost every event we organize in our context is um, has an open bar concept where the, the drinks are free and flowing. Right? However, these are options that are available to every event professional in Ghana. Such that as an event professional, you can suggest to your clients whether they should have a tab bar, a cash bar, or an open bar. Once again, depending on the budget that they have and what is allocated to food and beverage out of that budget. So like I just mentioned, you can suggest to your clients to use a paid bar. And even with the paid bar, it can be an open bar or a tab bar where you have paid for some of the guests to consume some degree of alcohol and drinks. Once they get to their limit, the drinks are cut off. Or if they can afford it, they can have a prepaid bar where everybody can drink as much as they can. On the other hand, however, they can have a cash bar 
where the guests will pay for what they drink. And I believe that is where event organizing in Ghana should go. Because I, I have seen too many events, both on social media and, and in real life, where because it is a paid bar and they are not paying for the drinks, people drink anyhow, get drunk, and end up embarrassing themselves, sometimes ruining people's events. Have you observed that happening before? Yeah. Someone pays for you to drink at their event, and then you over drink, you get drunk, and you cause mayhem. But if you are paying yourself, you be careful how much you consume because it's coming out of your own pocket. So event professionals must learn that these are all options that are available that they can suggest to their clients. But they should bear in mind that whatever decision they arrive at should be communicated to the guests in advance. So that it's not like they were ambushed and then they just showed up at the event and they were told they have to pay for their drinks. That would be unfair. If they have to pay for their drinks, you need to tell them in advance that they can be able to prepare themselves adequately before they come for the event. Okay. Now, still on the issue of beverage planning, aside from the kind of bar that you can have at your event, there are also two main kinds of beverages that you can have. We have the alcoholic beverages and the non-alcoholic or the neutral beverages. So the alcoholic ones, we all know them. They are the, the alcoholic beers, the wines, the different um, kinds of, of strong alcohol that we have, including the vodkas, gin, brandy, rum, bourbons, tequilas, which depending on the kind of bartender you have and how creative they are, can be able to mix it with other neutral beverages to create what we refer to as cocktails. And this mixture of alcoholic and neutral beverages to create cocktails is what gave rise to the new kind of bartender that we refer to as the mixologist. If have you heard of the mixologist before? Um, yes. Okay. So they will usually do all the creative mixtures of alcoholic and neutral mm -hmm. beverages to create all kinds of sweet tasting alcohol drinks, sour tasting alcohol drinks, sometimes with different colors and different designs and different glass shapes with different straws, just to create some kind of ambience and experience yeah. for attendees at different events, right? Yes, yes Kasim. Uh, I, I observe that there are some, some uh, trees that or tree roots that people cut into smaller pieces Good. and then soak them in a bottle. Can we call those people mythologists? They are also mixologists. In this case, oh, okay. they are mixing different kinds of herbs mm. with different alcoholic beverages. Yes. So you see that most of the time, this they'll get these herbs and then they'll just pour perhaps a basic gin around it. Yeah. And they'll let it sit for some time. Then it will turn into another drink, which they will serve. And believe yes. you me, those who drink these drinks know the names that they have for each of them. Mm -hmm. Unless you're a drinker, you will not know. And depending on the kind of herb that they put in the gin, they have a name for it. I've heard all sorts of weird names like Kumi Preko and they, they have weird names. <laughs> What's right. something they learn? Is a craft that they master? Is a, is a what? It's a craft that they master. It's yes. Not just... It's a craft that they master. You don't just do it anyhow because if yeah. you are not an expert, you can cause poison. Yes. Kill people. Mm. So as to which yes. content is okay. Yes, please. You need to be able to be schooled in it. Yes. Mm. So the, the dosage and the dosage, uh, the, you know, the person to take at a time. Exactly. Yeah. Otherwise, you, you poison somebody. There's, you know, you've heard of mm. alcohol poisoning. There's mm. something called alcohol poisoning. Mm. Okay. Yeah. People, if people drink too much alcohol, they get what we refer to as alcohol poisoning. Mm. Oh. Yeah, because I know that from the basic uh, pharmaceutical knowledge I have, mm -hmm. if you take so much, because the liver, anytime you take in any um, drug related substance, the liver works so hard. So Good. when there's so much pressure on the liver, it can fail. Good. And, and even in the short term, those, mm, it affects mm. some of your bodily functions. Yes. Alcohol is one of those uh, hard drugs. Yeah. All right. So as an event professional, you need to take this into consideration. 
the kind of beverages that are served at your event. If you are hiring a mixologist, you need to let the mixologist clearly know what they can and cannot serve. And another thing too, I like to see mixologists do, which they do not do, is to be able to display a menu that tells us each of the drinks that you have and what went into mixing them. Yeah, the components. Yeah, sometimes people mm. consume these drinks because of the fancy names and they do not know what has been put in it. Mm. And they can't even tell whether they are allergic to or will react to something in one of the drinks. And you see that happening a lot. They don't put a the menu there, so you don't know. They just put a fancy name and you're like, oh, the name is nice, let me taste. What if mm. that one taste ends up poisoning the person? So as an event professional, you need to ensure that every drink that your mixologist is putting together, the menu is there showing what went into each of them. So that if someone decides to sue you people after the event, for giving them a drink that tried to poison them, you can be able to save yourself by saying, we clearly displayed the menu. He or she saw what was in it and still requested for it, isn't it? Yes. So you have to yourself of any wrongdoing. I don't, I don't, I don't hear that. Uh, you know, most of those uh, uh, ones, especially the local ones here in Ghana, yeah. uh, most of them they get towards tower, promiscuity, yeah. and because of that, it normally causes uh, um, prepism. Exactly. Prepism is a situation whereby your manhood gets up and will refuse to fall down. Exactly. So um, I hear that some of them do get it, especially those who take it over the bar. You know. Yeah. Like too much of it. Mm. Yeah. And and the other way too for the females, some of them too are engineered to dull the senses of females. Mm. So they give in more easily. Yes. Yeah. These are all challenges and threats that are at the doorstep of the event professional. Because whatever happens at these events are your responsibility. So you have to make sure that you monitor these activities, particularly in relation to the kinds of beverages that are being said. So ensure that your event attendees, who at that point in time are your responsibility for that one hour or two hours that they are at the event, are kept safe and not being put at any form of risk. So sometimes you realize that you attend some events and the event professional gives an order that this man has drunk too much, don't serve him any more drinks. Mm. And that is because they can see that the way the person is consuming the alcohol, it will cause a problem. These are all the responsibilities of the event professional. All right. So in terms of beverage planning, the event professional has to make sure that they have a good handle of the menu of beverages that are being served. If they are alcoholic, we need to know exactly the kinds of alcoholic beverages being served. If they are neutral or non-alcoholic, we need to know exactly which ones are being served. If there's a mixologist on hand doing various mixes of drinks, we need to have a menu telling us what each drink is and what goes into mixing them to be able to ensure that everybody is clear on what they are drinking and they are kept safe. Now, beyond beverage planning, we also need to look at some trends in terms of food and beverage consumption when it comes to events management. Now, this is because of the way in which the event management sector is evolving and how the tastes and preferences of event attendees are also evolving and changing over time. And the main trend we can see with regard to food and beverage in the event management sector is the introduction of various alternative diets. Like we mentioned, various people are adopting different kinds of diets based on sometimes medical condition and others basically because of their new lifestyle and how they want to live their lives and what they believe. So we have vegetarians who often become vegetarian because they do not like the way meat products are manufactured. They do not like the way animals are treated when they are being killed to produce these products. So they'll decide to become vegetarian. We can also talk about the pescatarians who eat only seafood. That's another kind of diet. Then we have the salt-free, pepper-free people which have been around for a very long time, but have now become very common because of people's decisions to live more healthier lives. Then we have the gluten-free people. Have you heard of those people too? Jifa, has anyone requested for a gluten-free menu option from you before? No. <laughs> okay. But it's also another emerging one. Such so that when you go to certain supermarkets, like for instance, Max Mart, 
you see a yeah. whole section dedicated to gluten-free food. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, because it's a new alternative diet that people are adopting. Right? So what's the difference? And it's about an enzyme that is in the food oh. that um, makes, makes foods that are not gluten-free have certain implications on our bodies over time when we consume them. So gluten-free foods do not contain this enzyme and therefore limit the, the tendency of someone to, to, be, to have adverse health implications or become obese as a result of consuming these food items. So a gluten-free diet is supposed to help you maintain a, a good health, overall health, healthy system. They have a whole movement around it. It's very detailed though. So your homework is to read more about gluten-free diets. Is that okay? Especially for you, Jifa. Because someone may come and request for a gluten-free diet or a gluten-free menu for a particular event. Are you there, Jifa? Hello, Jifa. Kasim, can you hear me? Yes, please, I can. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay, then perhaps it's Jifa who can't hear me. So there's a lot of information online about, particularly about the gluten-free diet, right? So when you get the chance, just read about it. And then if there's anything you want to share with us, you can go ahead and do so. Then we also have people who are now changing their diets more towards eating healthy ingredients. So this one we have seen our Muslim brothers practicing for many years now with their halal requirements, right? in terms of how they, they require the food to be processed and made before it will be good enough to be eaten. Kasim, am I right? That's true. Good. So it's not That's just about putting halal on the thing and saying it is halal. There are certain guidelines that you have to follow in preparing the food for it to qualify to be called a halal food item, right? And that is also similar to the new crop of buyers or consumers in the event management sector who are looking for healthy ingredients. So you realize that people are now going more for inorganic produce than, more for organic produce, sorry, than inorganic produce. So they'll go in for food items that were grown organically, that are free of pesticides, that are free of fertilizers, all of which they believe make the food items unhealthy. Please, does that make sense? Yes. Good. Then some people too would prefer to go for plant-based food. So you realize that organizations like McDonald's that specialize in producing burgers with meat are now investing in plant-based burgers. Have you heard that thing before? They are doing research to produce plant-based burgers. So instead of having meat in it, they are using plants items or plant organisms or plant-based organisms to create what is similar in terms of look and taste to beggar meat, but it's not beggar meat. It's made up of plant extracts or plant-based extracts. Again, when you get the chance, go online and read about um, McDonald's development of plant-based meat. It's a very interesting story. And I think people believe that that is the future of the industry, given that during the pandemic, a lot of meat in terms of cow meat and chicken was in short supply. Then we can also talk about cross-cultural fusions being on the increase. Right now, even in Ghanaian hospitality organizations and institutions, you can see that there's a lot of combination of cross-cultural fusion in the diets that we experience and even the beverages in the hospitality and tourism sector. Such that we have hotels that specialize in different food items from continental food to African food to Asian food. Have you experienced that? Have you experienced that? Yes, we have Turkish, yeah. Turkish food. Good, Turkish food, yeah. Indian food, Mexican food. Right now we even have Korean food 
in addition to Chinese food, which are two totally different cuisines, right? And all of these are being experienced in our context, Ghana here. And there are people who love the food, who I dare say are not nationals of these countries that we have talked about. But because of the cross-cultural fusions have developed a taste for these different kinds of food and they like and patronize them. Meaning that if you have such people coming together at an event, it would be nice to introduce these, some of these elements of cross-cultural fusion into your menu. And then finally, in terms of trends in food and beverage, we can also look at the people who are looking at the inherent nutritional value in the different food items that you consume. Currently, we are experiencing what the industry refers to as calorie counters. Have you heard of the calorie counters before? They do not eat food simply to eat and be satisfied, but they eat food based on a certain amount of calories that they have to be able to make up in a day. Yeah. Yeah. So for each food item, they want to be able to calculate the amount of calories in the yeah. food that will determine the nutritional value of it. Mm -hmm. So if they eat cake and, and that slice of cake equals their caloric intake for a day, that is it, don't eat anything else again. And that all goes back to the inherent nutritional value in the foods that we consume that have become a source of primary concern for various people, especially people who attend events. So sometimes you realize that Events will be organized, and there are certain foods in the buffet that you will see that nobody touches. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you see that only few people eat it, and then no one goes near it again. It is as a result of these various trends we have talked about, and even more, that are taking place in the industry. So as an event professional, depending on your food and beverage plans for your events, you need to think about some of these trends and how you can incorporate some of them into the planning of your food and beverage menu to ensure that the attendance at your events will have a pleasant and unforgettable experience. So that being said, what are some further issues we can consider in terms of food and beverage at events? In other parts of the world, it is a big deal when you're serving alcohol at events. And you need, therefore, to have a license to be able to serve this alcohol at this event. So if you do not have a license to serve alcohol at that venue, at any point in time, the authorities can come and shut it down on the basis that you are serving alcohol and you do not have a license to serve that alcohol. Sometimes if it's an event that involves a lot of food vendors, you may be required to get some level of licensing to guarantee that the food that is being sold by these food vendors is all safe. In Ghana here, for instance, if you have a food fair, you need to ensure that all of them have AMA licenses or permits to be able to sell food. Otherwise, you may not know what they are serving to the people who will be attending your event. Does that make sense? Good. Yes. Also, in terms of organizing your event and planning for food and beverage, you need to ensure that you have made adequate provision in terms of space for the food and beverage to be displayed and stored. Also, if there's the need for some equipment to be able to store this food and beverage safely, you need to make sure that these are also provided. So when I attend events and people use these, what do they call them? Chifa, those big bowls that they, they cover and they put the food inside. Sharpened Sharpen dishes. Sharpened dishes that are supposed to have some form of heat under them keeping the heat food under. And there's no heat. And they have just displayed <laughs> like, Chifa, can you laugh? Swear and I... <laughs> they don't put anything under all, oh, but for. Yeah. It's they're just for display. Hot water, hot water and then heat under. How? <laughs> Meanwhile, you are supposed to do this to keep the food warm. Mm, yeah. So that it will not lose its integrity as it has been displayed in the open. Right? Mm. So the yeah. equipment that they are providing is not adequate enough to ensure that the food is properly stored. Mm -hmm. Right? So as an event professional, you need to make sure that all these are available. 
in terms of keeping the drinks cold, there are certain drinks that lose their integrity when you consume them hot. Mm -hmm. Some of them, you actually have to consume them cold to avoid mm -hmm. them having an adverse reaction on your mm -hmm. tummy. So you need to make provision for, for cooling. If there is no freezer on site, some, some event professionals will go ahead and, and request for or rent a, a freezer truck. Okay. To make sure that they can keep the beverages cool. Right? And also in terms of how you are going to, where you are storing the events, food and beverages and the venue of the events. Is it easily accessible? And do they have the utilities? What mm. actually the most is when caterers cater for events and then you realize that just where the food is, on the side, there is two big bowls and they are piling all the dirty plates there. Next What's to the it? buffet table. Have you seen something? Yeah, yeah. Very <laughs> appalling. It's strange that I hardly eat when I go for events. So I Thank don't know you. if it's because I'm in the business. I hardly eat. The, ah. What I, I'll do is to take water. Because I want to eat any other thing. You can get me even cool. drinks. If it's not bottled or can to look for plastic cup or bottle, no, you can get no it. No way. Because of the way so, they are stored. Uh -huh. Because it, it looks as if which oh, because you're oh, in the no, 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 no. Rather than when you fall sick, wrong. Jipa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too many things that are wrong. So yes. Because for Very events at my place, people, yeah, people always complain it's expensive. Mm -hmm. But it's expensive because I put myself in it. Exactly. The kind of things I don't like when I go out. I wouldn't let you come and sit at my place. So I would exactly. charge you high. Exactly. And make sure I get everything right on point. So exactly. those who really pay for it end up becoming my friends. Yes. Because, because they'll they, down you know, of the bad experiences they've gotten yeah. before and all that. Yeah. 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 Very good example, Jifa. Mm. As an event professional, you need to see to some of these things. So like Jifa is saying... A certain standard will begin to be expected of you as an event professional, and you will attract a certain kind of clientele who wants that level of service yeah. delivery and are ready to pay for it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can't compromise on your standards. No. You also need to think about the setup, opening, closing, and departure times. Again, I've been to events where people are waiting for the caterer to show up. They will wait, they will wait, they will wait, they will wait. Hey! Anytime the food even comes, you are not hungry again. You don't want to. Eat. Yeah, it do happen. <laughs> because there's no coordination mm. between the setup time and the eating time. And so the caterer shows up when they want to show up. And sometimes caterers show up and by then a lot of people have left. Because mm. they couldn't wait anymore. Well, you most you know, caterers don't even respect. They, they can't be bothered though. Thank Once you. You pay them, they think, look, Thank you. Once right? you pay them, that's the attitude. Yeah, so as an event professional, knowing this, it should be factored into your planning. I'm giving you mm -hmm. this percentage at this time. You show up yeah. on time, you set up, you serve the food. When you are done, yeah. I give you your mm -hmm. balance. Yeah. If yeah. not, this is the deduction I'm going to make. Mm -hmm. And all this must be stated in the contract. Yeah. So that it's not like you are deceiving somebody. Mm -hmm. That way, when they are working with you, they'll put their, 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 their they will, they'll put all their, their, um, their ego aside yeah. because they know you demand a certain level of service and you will not compromise. Yes. And trust me, for those who insist on certain standards, they deliver mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they need the work. Yeah. And right now, everybody is a key trial. Everybody can. It's amazing. Do. Once you can fry fish, you're a caterer. You're a caterer. <laughs> <laughs> once they can cook for funeral, they are caterers. Caterers, that's so. No, even funeral, I've given them post though. Fish. 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 Once they can fry fish and cook banku, the person, the person is an expert. They call themselves a caterer. Caterer. So they are caterers for banku and tilapia. Uh, no, but they generalize it all. They try they do all. They do those salads and all those that. Thank things, you. Then they go and bring their family and friends to help them. Yes. Mm. No gloves. No um, hand gloves. No Nothing. hair nets. Nothing. They'll be you scratching their I'm, hair and everything. I'm actually taking my money to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
I made the mistake of going to look at how they do the food. Hey! Like you guys say, no gloves, no hair net, nothing. Same hand they used to collect the money. Yeah. The hand they went to put into the food. And they'll be talking over the food. Mm. Even worse. Can I see? I said, I buy it, no, when I step outside into the bin. Yes. <laughs> I'd rather throw it away than eat it and fall sick. <laughs> right? So these are things we need to take you cognizance of as event professionals because no matter what happens, you being the event professional are in charge of everybody at that event and whatever it is they are doing as part of the event. So that the ball drops with you. And mm -hmm. as a result, you have to make sure that everybody is doing what they are supposed to do. Particularly when it comes to cleaning and clearing arrangements. Some event professionals think their work ends when the event starts. So they don't do anything again. Mm. Your work hasn't ended even after the event has ended because you have to make sure that cleaning is done thoroughly and the entire space is cleared of all the items from the different vendors that you used. So if this is not done as an event professional, your job is not completed. And again, you need to look at the kind of providers you are working with. If you are working with different caterers, assuming you are doing an event that has to do with food and you require different vendors, you need to think about the selection criteria for each of the providers. Mm -hmm. In this case, who are you getting to provide catering? If your menu requires a variety of local and continental dishes, Perhaps it may require a caterer who is an expert in local dishes to handle the local part, and then a caterer who is an expert in continental dishes to handle the continental part. Because in my experience, it is rare that you will find a good caterer that is an expert in all of it. Mm -hmm. Some caterers specialize in local food, but when you give them continental cuisine, it becomes a bit of a challenge. So you need to understand the mix of caterers and sometimes the mix of beverage service providers. These days, when it comes to beverage providers at events, we have people who, who take care of the bar for the foreign drinks or the manufactured drinks. Then we have people who cater for the local drinks. Yeah. Have you realized that? Yeah. Yeah. All of these different combinations and denominations have to be agreed upon by the events professional with their clients mm. to be able to determine what they want and how they want it to be done. All of which will be based upon the budgets that they have to spend and what is possible within that budget. So based on this, we realized that the food and beverage element of event management is not an aspect that the event professional has to point with at all. Because like we identified in the beginning, it has direct implications on the experience of your event attendees. Such that it can determine whether or not the event attendees have a great time and talk about your event for several weeks, sometimes months to come, or have a very bad experience that they will not forget in a hurry and will continue to talk about for a long time to come. And with that, we've come to the end of our session for today.